In the summer of 1966, Walt organized a vacation for the entire family for a leisurely cruise from Vancouver. Old two-year-old Ronnie, Sharon and Bob, my sister and brother-in-law, and their little baby, Victoria, who was about six months old, and a mother and dad all in this boat. We celebrated Tammy's birthday, July 3rd, on that boat, and then my parents' wedding anniversary 10 days later. When Ron and Walt found a quiet moment to talk, Walt told him he was going to focus on Epcot and Cal Arts. Walt always looked for new challenges, and, and Epcot was his new and fresh challenge. And he once said to me, he said, you know, I, I think I need about 15 years. If I could have 15 years, I can complete this project. And at that time, he said, you know, I'm just going to turn over the films to you people. I think you can do a good job. I have confidence in you. But I have to concentrate on Epcot. Wed was also busy designing a ski resort called Mineral King near Sequoia National Park. Walt's interest in such a resort was sparked by his role as the master in charge of pageantry during the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley. In 1965, the U.S. Forest Service accepted this. And in September of 1966, Walt joined Governor Edmund G. Brown for a press conference on the project. We hope that we can uh, develop it in such a way that the families can come up here and have access to this great, uh, wonderful wilderness area. Journalists who attended the event were struck by Walt's appearance. Walt looked gaunt and drawn, but no one suspected there was something far more serious ahead. I was doing a storyboard, and the, and the room was filled with my crew and so forth, and he got in a coughing jag and his face turned red and he, and he, went, he kind of bent over and I said for gosh sakes Walt why don't you give up smoking and he says well guys the guy's got to have a few vices don't he something like that he was going to have surgery on the back of his neck that was set they were going to fix this problem that the old polar injury was causing and my mother came to my door one morning. She said, they took an x-ray of your father's lung and they found a lump the size of a walnut. Walt's doctors recommended that he immediately undergo surgery. Then we turned to him and said, uh, are you worried about going to the hospital? And Walt said, you're damn right I am. And we thought he was going in because of his old polo injury, but uh, that wasn't it. So we were all there sitting in the room. And uh, the surgeon came in after the surgery and he said, well, it was just as I suspected. Uh, it had, the tumor had metastasized. I give him six months to two years. Of course, it was like dropping a bomb in that room. To me, the most poignant story of this whole last time is his last visit to the studio lot just looking at this place that he had built, these people that he brought along, done these amazing things, and knowing he had to leave it all behind. And then he stopped about 20 feet away, and he turned and he said, goodbye, Mark. But he never said that to anybody before. Roy Disney, explained to me that he, uh, his last visit to Walt in the hospital, he said, I knew I, I was going to lose my brother then. He said, because here he was, he was talking very excited about the Florida project. Walt saw the complete map, evidently, of the Florida project on the ceiling above his bed.
as we got off the elevator on the floor and I saw Ron go striding into Dad's room and then come out with his arms up like that as though someone had pushed him back. And uh, when we went into the room, uh, I don't really, I mean, Dad, you know, his hands were on his chest and, uh, and he was gone and Uncle Roy was standing at the foot of his bed and uh, he was massaging one of Dad's feet, just kind of caressing it and he was talking to him, you know. And I don't know, it sounded like something like, well, kid, this is the end, I guess, you know, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I saw his love as I've never seen it before. It was 9.30 a.m. on December 15th, just 10 days after his 65th birthday. I cried in my wife's lap. <laughs> it put an end to a marvelous era. And, and I lay awake all night long. I couldn't sleep, trying to think what's going to happen next. They announced Walt's passing, and uh, then they cut in Julie London's voice, and she sang the Mickey Mouse Club song. Uh, M I C K E Y M O U S A. <sighs> I had to pull off the road because my tears were blinding my ability to drive. The news of his death revealed his immense role in the shaping of 20th century entertainment. Just an ordinary man with the most extraordinary talent of making you feel that you were important, where in actual fact he was the one. This was a man that had one foot in the past because he loved the nostalgia and used it in many uh, motion pictures and television shows to get through to the public. And one foot in the future because he loved the technology. You put him, you drop him in a, a glass of water and like a Japanese flower, he is expands in all directions. Huh? So it's the expansive Disney that's moved out in the world in so many different ways and has done nothing but good. I mean, here is a man who had scant education. You know, his parents were not exceptional people, except in their character. He was not much of an artist. But somewhere came this, uh, this amazing factor of knowing what drama and comedy was. And so I'm afraid we're just going to have to say, well, Walt Disney, genius, period. means a lot to me in that something will never be finished, something that I can keep developing, keep plussing and adding to. It's a lie, it'll be a live, breathing thing that will need changes. The thing will get more beautiful every year. Mm -hmm. 